welcome everybody. This is uh, WDYT, What Do You Think? And uh, we may not stay on this theme uh, forever. We have a couple other guests that we're looking forward to. Uh, but for now, we're sticking to this theme of what about the church and where are we going with it? What is the hope for it? What, uh, where does it make us a little disappointed and frustrated? And uh, tonight we have uh, someone who's actually a relative of mine, though, though it's far enough away that we don't get to see each other very often. So this is Jolene Sharp. Uh, I have a cousin of family, all Sharps. So this is a, what, daughter-in-law of my first cousin. So, uh, but she's been watching. She and her husband have been watching. And uh, I got a passionate uh, email and we just said, Jolene, come and talk to us. And let us let everyone else listen over our shoulder as we talk about this. I didn't know what so, I was in for, Ty. <laughs> what's that, what's that? I'm sorry. I didn't know what I was in for when I sent that email. Yes, well... <laughs> Thank you for being willing. We think it's real and we think your story reflects a lot of stories. And let's just, let's just try to touch that. Anyway, let me just have a quick word of prayer and we'll launch in. Our dear Father in heaven, I pray that you will bless this time that we're together. May it be thoughtful, may it be real. And um, we love the church. Jesus loves the church. Father, we know the church is in your heart all the time, every day. And uh, we, we, we just want to be as um, close to your heart as we can as we wrestle with what form that church should take and can take. We want to hold on to the new wine that is um, the gospel and Jesus. And what does that mean about the wineskins and the institutional church and what we, we all long for. So bless this conversation and if it starts some other people thinking and uh, adds to the ripple of people trying to do something about church. We'll be thankful. So bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, your email starts in a story. So why don't, why don't you, you know, briefly, but, but tell, us, tell us kind of what started this journey as you were wrestling with what this church mean. Sure. So probably the best place to start this story is with the birth of our daughter, Lena. So I have two children, Corin is 10 and Lena is eight now. So she was born in 2012. And when she was born, we learned that she has Down syndrome. So, um, you know, you're learning to kind of rethink some things about your life. And one of the things that we realized pretty quickly about that was that it was gonna change the educational trajectory um, for our kids because um, Adventist schools have not invested in spe special education supports for students with disabilities and so Adventist schools just weren't going to be an option for her and as we started researching um, you know kind of what this needed to look like we pretty quickly realized it was going to mean a move for our family to really kind of the far other end of town um, to be in a school district where she would really have some great supports she'd be able to be included in a general education classroom with her peers she'd have access to a general education curriculum these are all things that were really important to us so um it's a long story, but God took a pretty direct hand in making that happen for us. And we found ourselves living um, about 40 minutes away from the church that we'd been attending for quite a few years at that point. Um, and we kept attending that church for quite a while. Um, but we found over time um, that it was becoming increasingly difficult to really feel that sense of belonging and connection. It's partly physical distance, um, partly just that we weren't connected to the school community. Um, but we continued to attend. We were very involved and we have lots of good friends still there. Um, we were very close to the pastoral team. It has great pastoral leadership, um, but around about a year ago, we ended up connecting with a, an Adventist pastor who does uh, house churches. So his ministry is kind of what he's dedicated his, his ministry to. And he got us thinking about some things. And we read a book called Pagan Christianity, which wrote, raised some interesting questions. And we found ourselves in a place of longing for more. And I don't know how to make it concrete except to say we felt like church was programming 
Um, but where was the life changing passion? Um, and we felt in the end, we, we kind of wrestled with this for a while. It didn't happen overnight, but the more we prayed about it and the more we kind of wrestled with what is this supposed to look like for us? What, how do we bring our children into church as a community, walking with God and what that really looks like? The more we prayed about it and wrestled with it, the more we felt like God was maybe calling us to shake things up a little bit. And we didn't even make that decision without talking to the pastors and talking to our parents and people we trusted, spiritual advisors we trusted, but we kept praying. And the more we prayed, the more we felt like God was really calling us to step out of what was comfortable and try something new. And we ended up connecting with a couple of families um, who live very close um, to us here, kind of on the other end of town, who were having a similar experience, um, who really felt like they needed a different kind of community to worship in and be a part of, and that there was something more, that there was a, a different calling. And so we have uh, kind of created this little new community here on our end of town. This is a very new thing, or I should say it was very new at the start of COVID. <laughs> COVID has kind of introduced some, some new complexities to that, but we're still figuring out what this looks like, but that's kind of what our church journey has been. It's been this experience of feeling called to something outside our comfort zone. I guess that's the most concise way to say that. When have you found the something more, at least so far? It's, it's a story still to be continued, I think. We're in that process. Um, I will say that not having an institutional church to rely on in terms of being kind of the source of our spiritual life has forced John and me into a new kind of reliance on God. Um, that's been part of this experience, I think, for me, is saying no one else is going to take care of this for me. I'm not going to be spiritually fed by someone else. My children are not going to be spiritually fed by someone else. We've kind of taken on this seeking relationship and this real total reliance on God to say, we need you to show us what we're supposed to be learning to guide us through this. And it feels almost a little bit like being on the on the frontier, like you're kind of, it's being created as we go. But it has, I think, forced us into a deeper walk with God because we just have no one else to rely on. And that's, again, not to say that we've completely cut ourselves off because we still have people we talk to in a community here, but it's very much a... God is shaping this as we walk with him. And it is really a new level, I think, of reliance on him instead of on an institution or a comfortable program, if that makes sense. Willow Creek in Chicago, are you familiar with that at all? And Bill I, yes, I am. 40 years of history. So after 25 or 30 years of that, uh, their philosophy was, you come here and then we'll provide the cafeteria for you and here's small groups and here's preaching and here's stuff for your kids and here's a community ministry and you come here and you'll grow because we're feeding it to you and they did a pre and post survey and over the length of time no one had grown <laughs> by whatever criteria they were measuring i don't know all that criteria no one had grown any with this cafeteria service which was wonderful yeah and truthful and yeah. riveting but they said people were going to have to become self-feeders was the phrase <laughs> where, where, where you're doing what you're talking about is yeah. you have to get some of this out yourself and own that so that sounds like you resonate with that story yeah very much and in fact when john and i have talked a little bit about this the phrase that we've used is kind of the approach to ministry of if we build it they will come and um it's kind of this very program and institution centric approach to mission right we have a church building and we 
um, we have programming and we'll maybe have evangelistic series, but we are asking people to come here. If we build the right programs, if we have the right appeal, then people will come and the ministry is based here out of these programs in this kind of the structural base. And I think that John and I have been impressed with the fact that often we have to meet people where they are. And I think there are a lot of ways that can look for us right now. We believed that that meant that God was calling us to create a different kind of church community. And it has meant much less reliance on structures and leaders and institutions and programs and a lot more very direct connection to God and a very passionate seeking of what his will is in our day-to-day -day lives and in the community that we're trying to create. So you mentioned Pagan Christianity. That's a great book, which just strips away so much of what you assume is holy and the way it, so it sounds to me like God just has you on a journey back to a New Testament church. Yes, that's exactly it. And I think that the authors of that book refer to organic Christianity, which I think is a really neat term. And, you know, I've, I've thought a lot since I sent my email to you and we've been talking about this conversation, you know, I've thought a lot about... I don't have all the answers. I, and I told you that, I think when we were talking, right? I said, I think I've more than I have answers. <laughs> I just, I don't really have all the answers, but I think I keep coming back to that idea of an organic walk and an organic community. The people are the church. And we say that, I've heard it said from the pulpit, but so much of what is happening in most churches, it feels to me anyway, it's been my experience, so much of what's happening is very top down. The, the growth is expected to be fed to us from pastors and leaders. And it's very much, you have the same people who get involved and lead the programs, but God's community, God's church has to be a group of people who are passionately walking with him and seeking his will in their lives and the working of his spirit as the force that drives everything they're doing. And that kind of walk, in my experience, tends to be pretty uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> you, now, know? you know you're talking to two preachers who like to tell everybody what this person is. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I know I'm stepping on toes all over the place. Oh, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> but no, I just, I have over, over my walk and there's, there's a lot to our family story and my personal story, but I've just, I think that a really authentic, fully surrendered walk with God is going to take us to uncomfortable places because yeah. I think that God takes us to the edge of where we can predict what comes next. He takes us to the edge of where we can see the outcome and he takes us outside of where we're really comfortable. And I think that the church as an institution um, and as a culture has been very comfortable for a very long time. And I think I'm getting to a place where I believe that whatever happens to the institutions or the structures of the church, it's going to happen as a result of the people of God finding that walk with him that turns their lives upside down. And I think about the Pentecost. I was thinking about this today as I was walking and praying this morning, you know, and getting ready for this conversation. I was thinking about the Pentecost when <laughs> the apostles were literally set on fire. I mean, tongues of flame literally came and rested on their head and they took that fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't them. God had, Jesus had amply demonstrated that left to their own devices, they were a disaster, <laughs> which is pretty much all of us, right? <laughs> we're a disaster when we're left to our own devices. The Holy Spirit came and he set them on fire and in turn, they set the world on fire. And I don't know what the structure of the church is going to be. I don't know what God's plan is for all of that, but I think whatever happens is going to have to happen because his people have stopped relying on comfortable institutions and safety guardrails maybe 
and have thrown themselves fully into an authentic walk with him that consumes everything else. That's what I got. Well, and as I told Dan, when I was traveling all over Southeast Asia and running into all kinds of institutional, uh, I call it institutional dysfunction, yeah. I realized I needed to quit worrying about that. And I started looking for disciples like yourself and discovered that God is raising up people who are not trying to attack the church. They're just trying to create authentic communities in the Philippines and the Southern Philippines and in Indonesia and all over Myanmar. Yeah. And I then had great fun helping <laughs> them in their relationship and blessing them and giving them permission because you know they're sort of given the riot act like they're not Part of the church and i said no 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 you are exactly the church if god's calling you to that do it now it's a whole lot more work it's uh, yeah. <laughs> uh you know it's scary but yeah. it's much very much more so rewarding than just being fed and regurgitated yeah yeah i think and it's interesting talking about this. I don't have a frame of reference for what this looks like, you know, outside of my culture, outside of a pretty, you know, the United States is a wealthy nation, we're comfortable. And I wonder sometimes if it would almost be a little easier for us to remember what this was supposed to look like if it was a little less comfortable. But, you know, I feel like we're living in a time where it's getting harder and harder to insulate ourselves from the chaos of the world. <laughs> I don't know if y'all relate to that. There's a lot of chaos. And I think a lot of folks are feeling unsettled by it and uncertain of what the future looks like, even here in the United States where things are very comfortable. And I think <clears throat> sometimes the reaction to that is to double down on the things that help us feel like we have a sense of control. And sometimes that means institutions that we've come to trust or rely on. But my, I keep hoping that maybe as we, as we see the world become more chaotic, we will experience that as God's calling to remember how much we have to rely on him. That really that's the only thing there is to rely on. That that total reliance on him and that total surrender to what he has for us and what his plan is for our lives is really all there is that we can depend on in the world. And if that's what comes out of this, I don't think there's any institution or structure that can stand in the way of what he, he intends to do, because his people will be on fire like the Pentecost, and he'll set the world on fire again. But it's got to come from that place that organic the organic church god's people on fire and connected with him and i was thinking about that analogy that jesus used of the vine and the branches that's a direct connection it doesn't go through a proxy you know that branch that the vine and the branches are directly connected and the life flows directly from god through his people it has to be a personal connection with him that allows that spirit that life the love of god the transforming power that comes with the love of god to flow through us directly we can't depend on institutions for that we can't wait for somebody else to tell us what that's supposed to look like we can't wait for the right program to come along to have that and i just think in a comfortable culture we've gotten so used to just relying on those institutions and structures as almost a shortcut and instead, it's cutting us off from that flow, that life-giving flow that is the force that transforms me, but then also transforms the people around me. Well said. Well said. I, I, I have a couple of directions I want to go, but I would at least like to hear a little bit about what you're doing with your church, so at least know what we're talking about. Yeah. So I think I mentioned that it's three families, us and two other families. We have children, each of our families of different ages. Um, and uh, we, so we started out, of course, meeting in each other's homes. Um, 
pretty periodically, there was a transition period because, um, you know, our family and one other family had still had commitments. We were in positions in the church that we had been attending. And so we didn't want to renege on that. We waited till that, you know, we, we kept fulfilling those responsibilities. So we were kind of attending there and doing some of this too, um, through some of that transition. Um, but we just started meeting in each other's homes and we haven't, had a lot of structure. It's been a fairly unstructured approach. So we get together and we do praying, we do singing together. We tend to share a lot about what's going on in our lives. What has God been talking to us about? What has he been working with us on? We try and involve the kids. So they'll suggest songs or they'll talk about a Bible verse they like, or, um, you know, they'll get involved in the discussion. Um, eventually they'll go and play outside <laughs> and the adults will keep talking, but it's a very kind of a free form gathering. It's a lot of sharing from our hearts about what, how we're walking with God in our daily lives. Um, and as COVID hit, we had to pull back from that because we weren't really seeing, <laughs> you know, we weren't gathering in each other's homes for a while. So it's been a little bit of a struggle to figure out how to kind of try to get back to that without running health risks. So for example, this weekend on Sabbath, we're going to meet together outdoors. Um, so we're still figuring out the structure, but a lot of it is praying for God's presence to be in this community, living together. We always share a meal. So every gathering that we have together, we share at least one meal. Um, and we'll just potluck it and we'll pick a menu and everybody brings some piece of it. So there's a part of just eating together. Um, and it's just kind of, it starts to feel like a family. Um, but it's a lot of very practical discussion around how are you walking with God? What are you, what is God doing in your life right now? And what are you struggling with? And sometimes that turns into a really long discussion and sometimes it's a shorter discussion and we go outside and play with the kids. <laughs> but it is a community of people who are trying to share an authentic walk with God together. And I, the, the thing that I think we're still struggling with, and I'd love to hear advice if you and Jim have any, is, and, and COVID has complicated this too, we want so much to be a force for outreach in our community and not just be an insular social club because I worry very much about this devolving into that, about it just becoming a more exclusive social gathering than the one we were already a part of. It need, we want very much for it to be mission driven and for this to be a place where people who maybe who wouldn't feel comfortable stepping foot in a church would feel comfortable coming and seeing what it looks like when Christ followers are walking with him and in relationship with him. And I don't know that we have a good read on what that looks like yet. I, I mean, a lot of prayer has gone into it and there are relationships in all of our lives where I think we think there may be openings to invite people to join. But it's also been a little tricky because how do you invite strangers into your home in the middle of COVID? <laughs> so we face some challenges with that. I'm going to be really honest if we don't know at this point exactly what the next step is on that front. Join the club. <laughs> no one's a leader. No one says, okay, now let's pray. No one says, uh, let's open up Second Peter 3 today. It's all free form. Right. It's very free form and organic. Now we have talked about potentially reading uh, a book together as just to provide some kind of common discussion material. Um, we've talked about um, the book Reimagining Church, which is written by one of the same gentlemen who wrote Pagan Christianity. You guys may be familiar with it. Um, just as kind of a way to help spark some ideas um, and have something, a common discussion point. But a lot of it is we kind of go with where the spirit is leading. So we always start with prayer. So I feel like that's a pretty important bedrock. We need to invite God into the space and invite him to lead in what happens. Um, so that's, that's an important piece of it, but the discussion tends to be very free form. And actually the neat thing about it is sometimes the kids take more of a lead than you might expect. 
um, we had a, a really neat experience when we met a, a couple of weeks ago where um, one of the kids that's a member of our group um, spoke up and was talking about something she read recently about why it can be helpful to kneel when we pray. And it was such an interesting and, and thoughtful contribution. And we ended up kneeling together and praying in response to that. And it was just, and then she led, she started that prayer off. And it was just such a neat, it was a neat moment for her to have that opportunity and feel comfortable to, to do that. Want to respond to the service? You know, so far it feels holy. It feels like you're on the way to something that it might have legs under it. You haven't found it completely, but you think it has legs under it and it's something yeah. you want to keep pursuing. Yes. And, you know, the other thing I'll say about it is it feels a little bit like we've reclaimed the restorative piece of the Sabbath. Um, I think for us, and it was partly a function of the fact that we were driving a really long ways to church for so long. Um, but I think we had gotten to a place where Sabbath was exhausting. I'm talking to a couple of pastors. <laughs> you might maybe relate to that. <laughs> um, Sabbath was exhausting. It was a lot of commitments and a lot of programming. And sometimes it was being gone from, you know, mid-morning until supper time between different programs that were happening and commitments that we had. And I, it, it got to where Sabbaths could be very stressful and we would end up feeling depleted. And over the course of this pandemic and all of the crazy stuff that's been happening, we've both had, we've had stressful things that have happened. We had a tree fall on our house and our car, like all kinds of crazy stuff. It's 2020, this is the year. So just a lot of stressors and things that were happening. And through that, Sabbath has become our salvation. It's become a respite again. And our children look forward to it. We actually have a special supper that we've instituted on Friday nights to welcome Sabbath in. And Sabbath has become it's become a blessing again in our family through this experience. And sometimes that's just our family because our church group isn't meeting that week, and, but sometimes it's the group. And whichever way we're going, it feels like God is very, very present in those Sabbath hours again. And they're restful and they're restorative. And I feel, um, I feel like Sabbath has perhaps returned a little bit more to what it was meant to be at, at least for our family in, in this. I'm gonna jump in, Jim. Yeah, I was just gonna say, one of the models that I have heard for family house churches is that the house church meets three out of the four Sabbaths a month. And then on one Sabbath, they all come together for a grand celebration, bigger church, where you're part of the bigger group. Yeah. And then you go back to being in, it's a, it's a combination. So, so you have larger, a larger network. Mm -hmm. right. So the larger group can do some things that you can't do by yourself. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't have the choirs, you can't have the high church if you're into high church, or you can't have the bands or whatever kind of music you like, but worship, and you can do worship around, as you know, very, very well with just sitting around singing and praying. But I know I like that but I also like getting together with everybody. So yeah. That's a model that if I were doing a house church, I would want to get together with everybody periodically. But Yeah, and I think we've even said there may be times when we, you know, we go to the big church that we've been attending sometimes too to reconnect with people that we've missed seeing and to experience a little bit more of that larger community. Um, and I don't think we've shut the door on any of that. Um, and the other piece I'll say is that we really want community service to be a big piece of what we're doing in this church community. Um, again, the in-person volunteering kind of got shut down with COVID. So we haven't been able to do as much of the hands-on volunteering as we wanted, but there have been some opportunities with some needs, some financial needs that came up that we've been able to, um, you know, that we've been able to help with or contribute to. And I think that's kind of, we want to move that direction too, that there's that very big service component to what we're doing when we're together. Um, 
and even on the weeks when we're not meeting with our group, um, when it's just our family, we've started uh, spending time on Sabbath with our kids, sending cards to people we know who are sick, or we did a birthday, a special surprise birthday package for a little girl who's immunocompromised and was feeling sad about not getting a birthday party and we shipped that off. And we've been trying to do things like that for the kids so that it's not because part, part of what I think we've struggled a little bit with what church had become for us was um, it was kind of passive. I mean, we were involved in programs. I taught kids out of school. John was an elder. We were very involved, but a lot of what our kids were doing was going and consuming. They were consuming the programming. Um, and so we want to make sure that for our kids, church is an active thing that we're all participating in and that there's a role in it for them and that it's outward focused and not just about what am I getting out of this. Wow. So where does that leave those of us who are still in the institutional church? <laughs> great question is there any is there you know any, we're just going to meet once a month with our big buildings yeah yeah i mean i don't know that i have an answer to that dan i don't know what god's vision for the seventh day adventist organization is and for the institutional church communities that exist in these buildings and you know i think there's probably i, I was talking to my dad about this actually this morning and he will say often, you know, I think there will probably come a time where we can't keep doing things the way we've always done them because the world is just not gonna support that anymore. And we're all gonna kind of be shaken enough that it has to become very real for us personally. And I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means for the church structure and organization, but I do know that whatever happens, it's going to come through the very authentic and real relationship and the presence of the spirit in the lives of the people of this church, because no matter how big this institution gets, no matter how many members you have in a church, no matter how many layers of hierarchy or structure you have, it's still people. And if God sets his people on fire, I don't think there are any limits. I, I, maybe I said that already. I just, I think if God's people truly, truly are set on fire for him, it will reshape the institutions around that. But I don't know how we get from here where a lot of what we're doing is very comfortable and maybe um, needs, to be, <laughs> needs to be shaken up a bit to where God can do that, where that fire can really be displayed in everything that's happening in his church. So Jolene, do you know the name Milton Adams? Yes. Okay. So are, are you kind of on his model? So we're not following his specific program. I think yeah. his program is fairly structured, but Milton is actually who we met. He yeah. stayed in our home. Um, he was coming through town and uh, stayed with us one night and we talked for hours uh, and talking to him is part of, I think, what lit this fire. I, I think it's the thing that pushed us over the edge. <laughs> it's all Milton's fault. <laughs> He's the enzyme. He's the catalyst. Yeah, he was the thing I think that finally brought together a lot of what we've been feeling and made us feel like there maybe was a way forward for us that felt more authentic to what we were we were feeling called to. And you were saying simple, something? Simple church person? Yes. He's the guru of a simple church? Yes. In the, in the Adventist church. There's a yes. simple church that's not Adventist, and there's a simple church that's Adventist. Okay. Yes. So uh, he's the Adventist version, yes. Yeah. Because I had never heard of it until I got to the Philippines, and people began to talk about it over there. I said, Interesting. What is it? Yeah, he works out of a conference in the Midwest. I actually forget which one it is now, but um, that's kind of his home base, but he travels all over. And Simple Church is kind of the model that he uses, but he had, you know, his, yes, uh, as Jim said, it's like an ad, it's an Adventist approach to Simple Church. And, but it's house churches with some sort of curriculum and has certain ingredients to it. 
I think his approach does have, uh, I think there's a training program that he would walk you through and there are some kind of structures that he puts around that. We have not directly affiliated with that as an organization, um, but generally speaking, the approach and the philosophy is kind of what, what kind of encouraged us to give this a try. Yeah, well, and, and the nice idea is if you are in an environment where people are gonna criticize you, being under his umbrella can sort of dissuade some of that criticism and say, no, we're, we're part of the official church. Yeah. It's all good. So if, if the criticism ever starts heading your direction, uh, <laughs> it might be the way to, yeah. You know, get a cover so that you can say, no, we're okay, blah, 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 blah. Because there are some saints who think it's their job to be the junior Holy Spirit. So. <laughs> Well, you know, John and I have talked more than a few times about how sometimes church becomes a system of behavioral controls that we like to wield, uh, you know, for other people. And um, that's how we get bogged down in the minutia. Sometimes I think we think it's our job to control other people's behaviors. Um, but, you John, know, I John 21. Yeah, I'm now gonna have to go read it again now as soon as okay, we get John out. 21. It's the last story in the book of John. When Peter says, Well, what about him? Jesus says, What is that to you? Yeah, you follow me. It is okay. not our job to control anybody else, it is not our job to complain about anybody else, it is not our job to know about anybody else. Yeah, follow the master, period. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that they said in pagan Christianity, and I, he, that stuck with me, he said, we've forgotten what it really feels like to truly rely on the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I think sometimes we forget to trust the Holy Spirit to work in other people's lives. Um, you know, when, and that's, that's what we're enjoying, I think, about this kind of organic community is we are all in this journey where the Holy Spirit is working in each of our lives. And then we come together and we share that. And I don't, I'm not responsible for what that looks like in anyone else's life. All I'm responsible for is my walk with God. And then in sharing that in every opportunity that he gives me. And I think we've all kind of taken that approach and it kind of, in a way, it's a weight off. <laughs> out I don't have to try and control anyone else I don't have to try and control the world around me that's God's job my job is to listen to his calling and to be willing to follow it even when it gets a little uncomfortable um you know that I you know I was talking to my dad earlier I think I mentioned and he said I mentioned that you'd ask Dan well what what advice would you give to pastors what about those of us who are still in the institution what how do we you know, how do we address the concerns of people who are wrestling with some of these questions? And my dad said, you know, encourage pastors to support the members of their church when they are feeling called to something. Because I think my folks have been through an ex experiences where they really would have liked to have been able to try some things that were a little more out there that were house church based or something along those lines. And they got so little support that they didn't feel like that was, they felt like it essentially made it harder to do than they could achieve without any support. And so I think there, my dad's advice was have pastors support new ideas, have them be willing to support members who feel like they're being called to try new things, to shake things up a little bit, instead of being afraid of new ideas. And I mean, that's easy advice to give in the specifics that may be harder to do, but that was an idea that we talked about when I was on the phone with him this morning. Just, you know, sometimes it may just be a little bit of encouragement that members need to feel confident enough to step out there and try something new and different. I, I believe a lot in people hearing the Holy Spirit for themselves, and I... I celebrate people pretty often for that. When I know that they just yeah. did something, said something, acted in ways, I said, "You, that's because you heard God and you heard God yourself. But uh, just to play the devil's advocate now, I mean, I have pastored really large churches yeah. and, and if very many people went to do something on their own, 
and not stay with the church, those will become yeah. relics. Right. And impossible to maintain. Yeah. And they're difficult to maintain now without renting them almost constantly. We can't, we can't stay open, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I wrestle with that. You're a product. You, you are who you are, at least partly, because somebody put a bunch of churches together and raised a bunch of money to build schools and build a Southern University that yep. gave you who you are. Right. That's absolutely and a bunch right. of house churches probably aren't going to pull that off. You know. Yep. So, so how do we wrestle with this? You know, somebody yep. raised enough money to send my parents to be missionaries in Thailand. Yes, there are self-supporting missionaries, but they're just huge. There was a time in Singapore where there was a hundred missionaries in Singapore at the same time. Yeah. You know, and God did that because there is this yeah. church. But the church also has the risk of causing what you have had experienced. We, you were, you were dying spiritually without. I, I circled the word more all through your email. Yeah. <laughs> There's more and then more and then more and different. Uh, and you were looking for something more. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fair point. There's, at some point, there is a collective work that is happening, right? And I don't, I mean, the power of the gospel spread exponentially because God's, you know, God's, the disciples and the apostles and then the growing church community were all unified in this purpose this fire that had been lit by the Holy Spirit to share this gospel all over the world. And that involved a lot of sharing of resources. I apologize, my text message notifications are dinging like crazy over here. Um, you know, there was, there was a collective investment in that work that happened. And I think there has to be unification around the mission that God has given us. Um, and I don't know how much of that is I don't know. I don't have all the answers to that. What, how much of that is driven by institutions and structures? How much is driven by the fact that God instills in his people a common purpose that brings them together? I don't know. I don't have all the answers to that. And I don't even know. I can't even sit here and say today, Dan, that what we're being called to I can't tell someone else that's what God is calling you to. I don't even want to tell people who are members of the church that we attended for years that God is calling them out because I don't know that. And I don't know what God's bigger plan is. And I feel like all I can speak to now here with you is that we feel that God has called us to the more, but you know, and my email, we felt like God was calling us to more. And by that, I don't mean. I, by that, I mean, God was calling us to step out and to experience him in new ways and to be really kind of lit on fire um, in some new ways from what we had been experiencing in our kind of safe, comfortable, cultural world that we had been living in for so long. Well, I think, I think we have to honor that. Absolutely. And I think lots of people are hungry for that. And, and, and I celebrate that. I haven't read those books, you know, Jim has, I have not. I just heard recently about the simple church and not knew anything about it. Uh, and what that does for the rest of it, so we have to agree, we want people to be self-feeders, to be able to find God on their own, to be able to hear the voice of God in their own soul. And, and that if you are not hearing the voice of God and God is directing you and inspiring you to acts of service and in worship to him and in deeper understandings of him, then, then the church has, has not done all that we could or should do. Yeah, yeah. Where that leaves the institutional church, I've been reading about Lincoln and the team of rivals, you know, they, they, yeah. they gave up a lot of bodies in order to hold this United States together. Yeah. So you're not just Tennessee all by itself and California. There's something about the whole country yeah. and we can do something in the world because we're united. Yeah. So I don't know the answers to all that. But we have oh, gone Dan, Dan, I wanted to offer a couple of pieces of advice. Yes, sir. I warn every baptismal candidate who is about to get baptized, they are about to experience the worst week of their life. <laughs> because the devil does not like to see radical disciples following Jesus. 
And so I'm gonna to say to you, if you're right now finding meaning and you're finding joy and peace, brace yourself, watch out. Oh, it's already been a year, let me tell you. <laughs> Trees yeah. falling out of nowhere. And that's why I say to you, surround yourself with a team of people that you know, like Dan or whoever, that when something happens, you can counsel and get input, okay? The other piece of advice I have is go on field trips. There are other models out there of home churches that you can go out and find and go and visit because they have figured out where the boundaries ought to be so that you don't have to recreate the wheel for a healthy home church. Great idea. That's great okay. advice. Um, yeah. and, and then the last one is um, about external focus. Yes, you don't want it to just be totally focused on yourself. So books like Quest, books like um, External Focus is a book uh, from Pastor in Longmont, uh, just give you enough stories to begin to get the idea of how you just start doing things outside of yourself. And with your kids, you get them involved and um, that provides this healthy segment that reminds you, no, it's not just about us. We like each other and we like getting it together. Yes, that's good, but there are other people. Right, and it ultimately has to be mission driven. And that's the thing, like this is not, this cannot be another social club. It can't be a cultural way of life. It's gotta be mission driven. and. That's great advice. And I, I would really like to find, I think, some other folks who have done something like this and done it successfully and gleaned some ideas. I think that would be useful. And the other thing we've talked about is while we want to be fully reliant on God and following his direct leading, we also don't want to unmoor ourselves from wise advice and people we trust as counselors. And we want to keep those connections because I think that is also a way that God can speak. Dan, our time is about up. Any last words? Oh, I just, I, I love it when I hear people hearing the call of God and saying, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm, we're going to do it. And they find someone else who hears it and they're doing it. And I go, cool. And can we agree that it, to the degree that the institutional church stultifies that or limits that, then it's wrong. And, and we have to... Um, somehow create channels. If we're going to stay with the institutional church, we're going to have to create a channel for that to continue. Where people have to be able to hear God, feel God, experience God, try new things, connect to the community. So let's agree that those are bare minimum. Those, those, those have to be metrics that we have to have in the church. And um, Yeah, and so we really have to change the definition of church from it's the institution to the church of the body of Christ that is passionate about following the master and whether they're at home or whether, you know, I think there's lots of different personality types and different kinds of people. Some people in their life need to sit in a church to heal for a while, okay? They haven't grown up in a healing environment and they need to hear messages and be around healthy people because most of the week they're around dysfunctional people. And it's a huge breath of fresh air for them to come in and hear the sermon and just, ah, uh, okay. And then they go back out fortified to last another week. Uh, so I think there's always going to be a place for the institutional church. But I hear a lot of younger people going, oh, we really like meeting together. And it's much more authentic. It's much more real. And I've had my own young people say, we like going to Sabbath school in our pajamas. <laughs> Oh, okay. It's a list of great words, you know, that I've heard a lot tonight, you know, organic and authentic and real and discipleship and hearing the voice of God. And uh, we don't know exactly how it's going to come out. These are all great words. May, may they all come true. Uh, give us six months. We'll give you six months. And then we want to hear again, Jolene. You know. I would love that. I'd love to circle back. And Dan, I'm sure you and I will email some more. I'm sure I'll have more questions for you. <laughs> I don't know, but, but thank you for the authenticity of your testimony. It's been very inspiring to me. 
and uh, may there may there be a movement of, Amen. Uh, in the same direction. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're all hungry for it, and God is waiting for us to to do this. Anyway, uh, Jim, you want to say a prayer and bless uh, bless that group, Jolene. Father, thank you. And it's always been simply about you calling and each of us responding individually to your call. So, Lord, I pray for Jolene and her husband, John, and the rest of the group there. Lord, bless them. Protect them. May they see clearly what you're calling them to do, especially when they have kids at home. Lord, um, and in this crazy time called COVID, um, give us wisdom as to how to reach out when we're not supposed to reach out. Lord, have mercy. We need your wisdom, but we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the amazing relationship that you love to have with us, in which you pour your love out on us and we just soak it up. So, Father, ah, yes, we love you. And we just love it if you'd come sooner rather than later. In Jesus' name, amen.